There's a clip from Robert Rodriguez's 2001 movie Spy Kids that more than anything encapsulates how I feel about City Skylines today. This hardware is getting in the way of my creative abilities. So obviously that was just a joke at the start of this video, but honestly, it's also relevant to this episode. Although before I jump into that, I just want to quickly give some critiques of Spy Kids just to make sure that this is uh, not quite muddy waters in terms of copyright infringement. I think it's the best movie from the Spy Kids series and also Floop has one of the best redemption arcs in cinema history. Um, if you disagree with me, you're, you're wrong, frankly. Anyway, it's also somewhat relevant to City Skylines because well, tackling the, the hardware, but definitely also software limitations of the game is something that was really important to me when trying to recreate Brussels and frankly also just makes recreating Brussels impossible. And you can see one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the effects of this on screen right now as I'm removing a bunch of roads. To dial it back a bit to the start, in the last episode I got many questions about how I actually got the map, how I put the terrain into the game and got the road map on it. Um, which was just the, the base that I started from. So when it comes to, to, the, to the terrain, I used terrain.party, which is a website that you can use to get a city skyline sized boundary box on Google Maps and download height maps uh, from real world data and put that into the game and import these in the terrain editor. Very handy and very easy to do if you want to get a real life geography into the game. Um, so that's what I did for the terrain. And then for the roads, I use the OpenStreetMap import mod, which uh, I will link both of these tools down in the description so you can try them yourself. The OpenStreetMap mod also includes a whole process of how to recreate things and create overlays um, in its description as well. So if you want to get an idea of generally how I went about this recreation, you can find it there. Um, but I honestly don't know if I want to recommend it because one of the problems is what you're seeing right now. I had to remove many roads in my map because um, I had a very basic road map generated from open street map data of just the highways and main arterial roads that go through the city. Um, but often what open street map import mod does is it creates way more nodes than would be necessary to create these in-game um, roads and usually when it comes to straight sections it's not too bad but especially if you get into curved roads what it tends to do is create many small segments of straight roads that all together create a curve instead of you know just creating a few segments of curved roads and not only does it kind of mess up the shape a little bit if you're looking for a perfectly shaped road you might want to draw them by hand anyway but it also creates a huge amount of nodes and let it be know that, known that highways also feature lots of curves and the same goes for the Brussels road layout in general. So I hit the node limit at the start of this episode. The node limit in City Skylines is somewhere around 33,000 actually, don't have it by hand right now. It's a number that, well, all things considered, you probably don't want to reach if you're building all of your roads by hand. Uh, but because the main roads were imported using this mod, I ended up hitting this node limit pretty early and because I had already placed many roads in the city by hand it was a shorter process to remove all of the uh, automatically imported roads and redo them by hand than it would be to create an entire map from scratch and do it all by hand to make sure I didn't hit the node limit too early. Um, but what this effectively meant for me was that the next few hours and by few hours I should probably uh, actually say quite quite many hours were all spent getting rid of specific sections of roads and trying to open up space a little bit in that node count so that I could build more roads all in an attempt to see just how much of Brussels I could kind of realistically recreate before I ended up hitting the node limits uh, because there's only a certain amount of road segments and intersections that you can build in city skylines until things start breaking down and you can go over this maximum number but the further you go and this is why the number honestly is hard to, to to pin into a specific number even though you can find a specific number mentioned is because it starts slowly breaking down at least that's my experience at some point your save will just not open anymore uh, and at some point before that, the roads will just not have zones next to them anymore. So you can lay down roads, but you can't actually zone or place buildings next to it. So 
this is all a very careful balancing act of <laughs> trying to make my roads uh, node efficient as much as possible and to see how much of Brussels I can actually lay down until the maximum capacity of the game is truly reached and I really have to give up at that point. And that's really part of the test of building Brussels. It's not even so much to try and recreate all of Brussels realistically, but see and test the limits of City Skylines itself. So the next topic that needs to be discussed is the overlay. I also got a few questions about how I made the overlay specifically and I'm a little bit ashamed to admit I don't have a specific method for it. All I did here is take a screenshot of Google Maps and then mess around with the screenshot <laughs> quite a bit in paint.net, inverting the colors, adding an alpha layer and making sure that only the roads remain visible and trying to get it to be as much as good as a, of a resolution as possible and it was a kind of a trial and error process and it doesn't really lead to the best results as you might be able to tell some roads are quite clear to see but altogether the overlay isn't very high resolution and you inevitably also end up with these labels that just show up on the map like Volume, which you can see on the bottom right there and well, especially given that this is Brussels and many of the labels will be there in French and Dutch, these cover huge parts of neighborhoods and make it essentially impossible to see where the roads are going there. So the process is far from streamlined and the results is far from streamlined as well, which is why I wouldn't recommend going about it this way and why I also don't have a, a good method to turn into a tutorial for people to copy. I honestly wouldn't recommend you try and do it this way. I did seek out ways to create vector images of cities, but very often the problem would be geographic pro uh, projection of whichever map you're using. Because the base map uses the same projection as Google Maps, I couldn't get maps from some other websites that create vectors and make a slightly better overlay because then um, it would be slightly warped uh, in comparison to the terrain and getting the terrain and the roads locations to match up exactly is of course a lot more important. So whatever it is that you're doing in terms of methods of putting the terrain and the roads into the game, you want to make sure that you're using the same projection for both of these methods and uh, that makes things a little bit more difficult. Also, for those that have seen Project Oslo, which I did a few years ago, which Altogether, I think was a lot more successful and actually turned into a usable city, unlike uh, Brussels here inevitably will be. Um, I used more or less the same method in there. And nowadays, with the knowledge that I now have, I would say the best way to actually create an overlay in the game is to use QGIS, which is a program that allows you to do basically stuff with map things anybody who's studied geography or urban studies or anything in that corner of, of things has probably um, worked with it before and it's a great way to try and get a real vector based overlay that you can get a very reliable transparent background to and also render in a higher resolution overall it's a much better solution and i would like to make a tutorial about this in the near future when this is coming out exactly i don't know but I definitely want to make a tutorial about how to recreate cities in this game. The main thing I just want to say here today is what you're watching right now is not the best way. So I'm not going to go that much further into it. One thing I will say is that using QGIS also has the added advantage of being able to have much more control over your vector image and choosing certain colors for certain row types. So for instance, you might want the lines for highways to turn up yellow and the lines for arterial roads to be red and the lines for local residential streets to be green and this will just help a lot in city skylines as well and make it a lot easier to copy these roads by hand because if you're building by hand like i am right here you also have to keep of course uh, google maps open in another tab and well constantly look at it and try to reference what kind of roads you find in different places and by making better overlays, you can streamline that process a lot as well. So altogether, it's not really the best method that I was using to make Brussels here a year ago, but that was with the knowledge I had at the time. And honestly, 
At this point, I have a lot more experience recreating cities in this game, so there's that. Now, I want to take some time not to be a negative Nancy this whole video and actually talk about some of the comments that I got on the last video because they were really cool to read. I read all of the comments, which you might notice if I if you see that I'm also liking all of the comments. Um, but anyway, there were some, some really cool responses there also about people who are studying geography or, or some, some kind of urbanism studies in uni and have used city skylines in school projects, which I suspect has happened a lot and it's always been interesting for me uh, just to, to think about as a thought experiment how much city skylines has done for people actually studying this field i know for me and i'm completely unashamed to say this it, it definitely pushed me a lot into studying urbanism i was always interested in cities and playing games like like sim city when i was younger uh, but never as much and and as hardcore as i've played city skylines at least for a few years um, and it was one of the reasons I started studying urbanism which is um, <laughs> I guess it, it, it sounds kind of stupid but then again I think it, it often happens that people end up studying whatever it is that they're studying because of some kind of pop culture product or something that they grew up with and that's fine we need more light-hearted things in this world that that Bring an, bring an audience to very serious topics and I think that's what City Skylines excels at. Of course it's not perfect, there are many problems with this game in terms of urbanism discourse. Uh, most of all I think the fact that it's made highways super popular and people love building junctions that in real life have displaced people and turned cities into car-centric, unsustainable, polluting messes. Uh, but it's fun in the game, I, I kind of get it. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's done some great things as well. I think it's spread the, the knowledge that roundabouts are the superior type of intersection to millions of people and examples like that, which I always like to quote. So yeah, altogether, it's a great game and it can push people into this field, which is just awesome. And I saw a lot of stories in the comments reflecting on this as well. I also had some really interesting conversations with people who work in cities or are politicians in cities. Uh, so thanks for that as well. You know who you are. Um, and it seems altogether there are so many people interested in how and, and, and if city skylines could be used in serious purposes. The main struggle is just getting people in the right place to where it can actually happen and you can experiment with it, which I would agree is also the, the biggest issue. I think there's a lot possible with this game and it can be a, a real playground for, for urbanism ideas, but it's difficult to link the audience that could use it but doesn't know the game versus the people that play the game uh, but don't know how to actually get into real urbanism uh, and link these people together in some way. And that's something that I will still grind my gears on for the near future. Um, and it's, it's honestly one of the main conclusions I had from building Brussels and looking into the case studies that City Skylines have been used in. It's all been very exploratory and it seems like every single time anybody has done anything with this game, they had to reinvent the wheel and kind of start over and explain everything to everybody. Um, so it's difficult to make progress in that sense as well. But there is a real potential and as far as I've looked into it, I think... Uh, digital twin cities are definitely the future. Uh, there are so many technologies that are uh, popping up with it nowadays and some of the biggest cities in Europe I know have digital models that are used within their municipal organizations to model all kinds of statistics within the city and big data is a huge topic that likes to be combined with this as well. Um, so I think city skylines can somewhat be placed in the same corner of thought just with a less detailed, less professional, but on the other end, also more approachable angle, perhaps. Um, so that's where I'm kind of coming from with that. All that to say, the only reason that I really started uploading this Brussels series, because um, like you probably know by now, I've voiced my discontent with the actual model so many times, is just to start this conversation and actually open up to the rest of the world, I guess, that I've been having uh, this conversation and that I'm thinking about this topic and somewhere behind the scenes I'm still uh, trying to think about it and uh, see what can be done with it and 
possibly you'll find some more things on my YouTube channel about it as well. I, uh, I've always been thinking about if there was a good way to put this out into the world and, and make a video about it or something, maybe even a video essay. But all things considered, I just don't feel like I know enough about the topic to, to talk about it with any kind of authority. Uh, so instead, I just like to open the conversation and see what other people are thinking and you guys uh, shared lots of interesting stuff. So that was really cool. Thank you. And uh, let's move on to the next chapter. So after a year of thinking about this game, I came up with a hot take that I also think is an inevitable conclusion to make about this game. And that is that modding is simultaneously the best and the worst thing to happen to this game. It's the best because it allows for so many new possibilities and it is basically change the gaming experience for most of its players uh, to be almost unrecognizable from what the game was like when it came out in 2015. Um, I think the only thing that's really just the same still is the UI and even that has gotten so many new buttons added to it depending on which and however many mods you've added to the game. Uh, there are so many things from the assets that people use to plop down new buildings that the game doesn't come with to the trees, especially the trees. Everybody likes to keep them custom because custom trees are just a lot more realistic than the in-game ones. Although in this case I did stick with the in-game trees because I figured it would be better to stick with low poly models. Although in hindsight I'm also not sure how smart that was because there are plenty of low poly models on the Steam Workshop as well. Uh, but it's something I went with here. And then of course there are the game changing mods that either overhaul the traffic AI or allow you to create completely new intersections, mess with the nodes, uh, change the entire gameplay mechanics, the way that people live their lives in the game, or just remove some mechanics from the game altogether. It's all really game changing and although the hardcore modding community is really niche and I think people in that community often uh, overestimate just how part of the big uh, how big of a part of the community of the game they are most players play the game very lightly modded uh, playing completely unmodded and without dlcs is very rare at this point um so all things considered it's it's safe to say that it's changed the game a lot especially considering most popular content of this game uh, is definitely quite heavily modded um, if not using that many assets and things like that, then definitely using some base mods like Move It or Traffic Manager or basic graphic changes. So all of this stuff is really awesome, but at the same time, the more mods and assets you add to the game, the more complex it becomes as well. Not just for the, the computer to handle, but also for players to handle. And I think this is one of the biggest paradoxes in a sense that it's the mods that make this game as good as it is. But there is a certain point where the mods just make it more and more complex and it raises the barriers of entry. And my whole idea was seeing if city skylines could be used in real life urbanism at all. But in order for it to be used and used to any amount of detail or customizability, you want to add mods to it and change it so that it can be more realistic and you can um, customize things. But the more mods you add, the harder it becomes for people to understand and the harder it becomes for hardware to run it. Which might not be a problem for streamers or hardcore gamers who are running 3070s somehow. If anybody actually has a 3070 right now. Um, but it's, it's going to be a lot harder for academics writing about this game and publishing papers about it. Or uh, people in city governments thinking about using this game in any way, uh, but don't really have the, the computing power to handle it. So I think whatever it is that you're doing, you want to strike a balance in here. And especially in the core community of this game, it's been shifting so much more to heavily modding and adding lots and lots of assets and everybody getting 64 gigs of DDR4 RAM just to be able to handle their thousands of workshop items. And Inevitably, if you want to do something with City Skylines to a broader public, I think you have to scale it down a little bit. And I think, for instance, Biffa is a good example of this, of making the game more approachable to a more general audience. Maybe the hardcore City Skylines nerds are going to roll their eyes and um, watch somebody else, but I think that's also fine. There are different roles for different people to play. Um, 
But all I'm thinking is that in presenting City Skylines to the outside world, you have to look at this balancing act of which mods do I want, which assets do I want, and which are cool but not absolutely necessary um, to try and keep things as simple as possible. And I think you can very well create a list of absolutely necessary mods and stick to these and stick to custom assets only in case we really need them or, or try to keep the amount of them low, which is essentially what I'm doing with this build here as well. Um, but it's something to think about. I think it's way too optimistic to present City Skylines as a game where you can do anything and you can build anything you want because yeah, while it's technically true, if you get into that territory, it's going to be super labor intensive to build those kind of cities and it's going to be really difficult to run them on PCs and it's going to be especially difficult for anybody who's not a City Skylines expert to even stand to even understand what the hell is going on. So yeah, this is uh, one of the, the biggest paradoxes, I guess, and why I think modding is both a bad and a good thing and I'm always trying to balance it out. Um, but I don't know what exactly the right balance is. Maybe traffic manager isn't completely necessary. Maybe you don't even need that many assets at all and you just need some graphics mods to change the, the look of the game a little bit. But otherwise, stick to vanilla and just try to re realistically recreate the layouts of cities. Or maybe you really want all of your buildings to look exactly the same and uh, try and be as close as reality as possible and go into a detail level as well. I don't know where exactly the right answer is, but it's... Uh, it's, it's how I would like to frame the conversation and I think it's one of the most important things to, to think about if you want to do anything with the cities in an urbanism perspective. Uh, if you just want to detail, then of course, by all means, just go ahead and detail. And if you want to play the game vanilla, honestly, I still do from time to time. Every now and then I just turn off all of my... Uh, I just do the no workshop and disable mods commands on Steam and just play the game vanilla because all things considered, it's still really fun and just its core game mechanics still hold up and even if it's not as realistic or detailed, it's still just a fun experience. Now, before I get back to talking about Brussels, just something that I quickly want to mention that I really should have had in the last segment, but uh, forget about it. My computer is still horrible and I'm still running on a really old rig that I've been making YouTube videos on since forever, as long as I can remember. And it's really due for an update, but turns out that 2021 is just the worst year ever to think about upgrading your PC because as much as I want to, it's completely unaffordable and honestly, at this point, also new parts are unorderable, so it looks like I'll be stuck like this for a while. But one of the, the biggest caveats in, in terms of Brussels, I should add, is it's really hard for me to actually run the simulation in the game. As long as it's paused, and you might notice that it's paused for most of the time whenever I'm playing, it's still fine and the frame rate is okay. Um, but if I unpause, the simulation just stops to a crawl and it's really hard um, to actually get it to simulate the city itself. Uh, which also means that Brussels is just kind of superficial here and isn't really simulated. If I had a better PC, then maybe, sure, I could have actually run the city and see how the traffic is doing. I had a bunch of comments talking about the traffic, which is <laughs> very uh, appropriate, because Brussels, I believe, is still the most congested city in Europe. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I can't really look too much into that, and this is all just a pretty picture here. But traffic in Brussels is definitely interesting. It's, it's one of those things that kind of makes Brussels what it is, isn't it? Uh, a city that has, to, that has to have so many problems, but also has its charms. And one of the reasons I think it's just so congested is it's one of the densest cities in Europe. If you look at a map of, of density in, in, in European cities, Brussels is up there with Paris uh, and way denser than cities like Amsterdam or Berlin, for instance. Um, so that's one part of the equation. And then also it just doesn't have good bike infrastructure, so it doesn't really have the uh, share of mobility of cyclists as Amsterdam has, for instance. Uh, pedestrian spaces aren't too optimized either. And there is a lot of public transport. 
actually, um, I believe about a quarter of the city's budget goes to transport alone. But a lot of this is also kind of bogged down by the traffic issues, because many of the transport it relies on are bus lines and tram lines that go on the streets and sometimes even uh, have to share all of their space with the one uh, car lane that's on the same street. So lots of issues there, and <laughs> traffic congestion is definitely one of the uh, iconic parts of Brussels, I guess. In many ways, it's also actually the result of car-centric planning. Brussels has a bunch of car tunnels going through the city center, mostly alongside the Pentagon Ring Road that goes around the city center. And most of this infrastructure was built around the 50s and 60s in time for the World Expo that was held in Brussels, uh, where also the Atomium was built. And well, modernist urbanists at the time remodeled the city in a vision of car dependence and really seeing the car as a vehicle for future travel. And it's created this ironic state where building infrastructure for cars creates induced demand and makes people drive cars around the city instead of using other forms of transport. And as a result, people rely on cars a lot in Brussels. And even though it has, if you look on paper, more car specific infrastructure like um, well underpasses and things like this than other cities in Europe it's more congested as well because it's di it's more difficult to use alternatives and so the old uh, slogan of, of building other types of infra infrastructure to, to fix the problems of car infrastructure really applies to Brussels as well um, and I think they're doing great strides in that sense. So for instance, during the Corona crisis, 40 kilometers of new bike paths were created and um, they're working on a new north-south metro line as well, which there are opponents and um, supporters for. And I'm not even entirely sure which camp I'm sitting in, but altogether the city is definitely doing things to try and fix its congestion issues. But I think it's it's honestly a stereotype that it deserves uh, to be one of the, the most congested cities in Europe. I just really hope they continue to be able to do things about it and open up streets to other forms of transport and also just life in the city. So that's something I just quickly wanted to mention. I also had some comments in the last video that people were disappointed that they saw me kind of moving toward their neighborhood and they're not quite really going there. Uh, which is a shame. Everybody likes to see their streets being placed in the map, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody will see it because I did cut out many segments of this time lapse. Uh, because keep in mind, I'm laying down every road in Brussels here. And some parts are just maybe not that interesting or it's just a lot of the same. Um, so I decided to just highlight some clips of the time lapse here. Uh, but also, there are just some parts of the city that I didn't get to in the last episode. And this would be one of those areas, the uh, area of Jet and Laken and Kukelberg, which I, I got a, a small part of Kukelberg in the last episode, I think, uh, but I didn't quite go up this much. These neighborhoods are interesting because they're not quite as dense as much of the rest of the city. This is also where the area with the Atomium is located and the gardens of the, the King's Palace. Um, so definitely lots of things to see here, especially for tourists as well. Actually, one of my favorite tourist attractions, which is the, uh, the gardens. They have beautiful, huge greenhouses that are open every spring. And I, wait, I said this in the last video already. Anyway, if you're ever around Brussels, definitely check it out because they're awesome. But yeah, that's what this area is all about. Now let's go to the last area that I wanted to show you guys because I think it's one of the most interesting areas of the city. Definitely one of the most dynamic and also I think it turned out as one of the best neighborhoods in this model. So we're getting to the area of the North Quarter and the surrounding municipality of uh, Scharbeek here, which is interesting um, because the North Quarter itself, which is the neighborhood that surrounds the North Station, is one of the unbrusselist <laughs> neighborhoods. That's a disgusting word. I'm very sorry. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's very unlike Brussels. Brussels in general has a very organic urban fabric with uh, many 18th and 19th century buildings lining curvy streets and uh, no 
specific overall vision or, or recent modernist urban planning. Uh, but the North Quarter is an exception to this. It used to be an old 19th century uh, working class neighborhood until it was raised to the ground in the 60s uh, for modernist ideas of large car centric boulevards with skyscrapers next to it. And in that vision, only, only a part of it was really completed. And I believe only six or seven of the skyscrapers, depending on how many you count, since they are working on a few right now, um, ended up being built around the North Station. And eventually, in the last few decades, a CBD has been growing around this. So you can already see uh, the skyscrapers uh, around this area here on the left of the screen. And most of these at this point are a bit newer than the original uh, Manhattan Plan, as it was called. Because of course, when you're building skyscrapers in the city, you have to look up to Manhattan, I guess, because that's the, the end-all, be-all example. Um, but yeah, it's really become sort of the CBD of the city at this point, and really unusual uh, compared to the rest of the city, in that you have none of these uh, quaint, narrow Belgian houses and, and none of the curvy, bendy streets that you have all throughout Brussels, but instead wide, straight roads on a grid pattern with huge buildings that if I can get very personal and just share my opinion, I feel very out of human scale and one of the worst things, frankly, that has ever been done. Although, even nowadays, I still do like going there because it's a really interesting neighborhood. Uh, it's dynamic. It's a neighborhood where I feel like a lot can happen and uh, a lot will be done in the future. So in that sense, it's really interesting. Uh, it's not quite as static as some other neighborhoods in Brussels. Um, but yeah, that's what makes the, the North Quarter so interesting. And Scharbeek, which is a municipality that uh, at least partly also includes the North Quarter and the CBD, uh, is right next to it and is one of the densest parts of Brussels and the absolute opposite. It's all these bendy roads, narrow streets, uh, old houses, uh, really interesting. Um, it's also, as some people pointed out on the last episode, I guess, uh, this area around here is also the red light district of Brussels. Um, but yeah, altogether, uh, complete opposite areas in terms of, uh, of urban structure, which is, uh, which is interesting. I think one of the things that makes Brussels a nice city to recreate in city skylines, at least kind of doable is the fact that most of the city looks so similar and most of it really is just a curvy messy road pattern with uh, organically grown almost houses around it obviously everything was kind of planned at the time but looking from above you can see it's a it's a very messy road layout um, and it makes it much easier than for instance some cities that uh, look a lot more planned like dutch cities where uh, you could have buildings being set back from, from, from streets and very specific kind of architectures in different neighborhood. Uh, Brussels doesn't really have any of that. It's, it's very similar everywhere. And the North Quarter is a small exception to that, but even that is not too difficult to build in the game. Um, so it's actually a really great city to try and recreate in city skylines if it weren't for the fact that it's so absolutely huge. The amount of people which you count to the city of Brussels is, of course, very difficult to pin down. Um, depends on if you want to base it just on the city itself, so the municipality or the, the region of Brussels, or even the metropolitan area, which includes some of the surrounding towns in Flanders that, even though they are in a different region, are directly connected to Brussels, so pretty much part of the same city anyway. Um, but the, uh, the estimates of the functional metropolitan area of Brussels uh, sit between 2 and 3 million, which is quite large and also quite a bit larger than Oslo. And in my idea, just maybe like 25 or 50% too large to realistically recreate the whole thing in city skylines. You have to end up drawing some boundaries somewhere. And for me, that ended up just being some outer ring roads where I decided to not expand into any of the suburbs beyond that because it was just not doable in terms of the node count. So that's why I put emphasis on closing the ring roads and finishing the parts within this to try and get at least somewhat of a natural border to the places that I've built in here. Anyway, that's all for today. I'll see you guys next time 
in a video where most of the roads will have been placed and I'm really not able to squeeze any more roads out of the node limits anymore and it's time to start zoning things and let the buildings grow out of the ground. So thanks for watching everybody and I'll see you next time.